in the conference, so look for him. All right. Our next speaker is Scott McNeil, and you had a very nice promo for him. And Scott is the director of NCL, the, National, the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab at the National Cancer Institute. And he will talk about nanomedicine development, the journey from publication to preclinical. Okay, uh, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks also to Biat, who's invited me uh, for the fifth time for Clinum. Uh, I'll say, as many others have said, that uh, Clinum is the highlight of my year as far as conferences uh, because you get to hear about terrific science and you also get to interact with uh, very famous, very uh, well-known uh, scientists in the field, uh, some of the pioneers that um, invented uh, many of the concepts that we've seen. So I've been asked to give uh, an overview of some of the things that we're seeing at NCL, especially with respect to um, uh, trends that we're seeing going from that proof of concept uh, up into uh, clinical translation and uh, filing of the IND, at least with respect to NCL. <clears throat> For those of you that are not familiar with NCL and haven't been here the last five years, uh, I can invite you to visit our website. Uh, just in brief, what we do is we generate data uh, for the investigator in support of their IND filing. <clears throat> we subject their material to uh, this assay cascade. It's three phases where we look at uh, in vitro, in vivo. Hey, that's Latin. In vitro, in vivo. There's my Latin. I don't have to change my slides. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, help them uh, with, with that clinical translation. Uh, we are a free resource that's available to anyone who has a cancer application uh, using um, uh, nanotechnology. Uh, so that's the last 10 years, uh, but uh, in 2015 we now received approval uh, to look at other indications uh, to do things like uh, formulation of, uh, formulation of uh, novel concepts. Uh, we can help with interaction with other indications such as infectious, infectious disease. Uh, this I have to charge you for, though, uh, but we're very eager and excited to uh, be able to leverage our 10-year our history and go into uh, these, these uh, new indications. Um, so after all the hype and uh, after, in, in my case, uh, going on 13 years of being in the, in the nanomedicine field, uh, what are some of the trends that we've seen uh, as far as capabilities? What, what's really holding true compared to what we were predicting uh, some uh, 10 or 12 years ago? Uh, one is that, as you've already heard, we can uh, reformulate insoluble uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, that way the solubility is now a function of the nanoparticle uh, rather than uh, in the small molecule. Uh, so um, through high throughput screening, we come up with uh, very uh, potent uh, KDs and we're now able to offer a drug delivery mechanism uh, for those uh, hydrophobic uh, compounds rather than uh, simply relying on uh, medicinal chemistry. Uh, we also can alter the pharmacokinetics, as you've, as you've heard several times uh, today already. Um, we can modify biodistribution. We can extend half-life. Um, I hate to say that's routine, but that is, uh, it is, it is almost commonplace where, at least in the NCL, we're able to uh, extend that half-life where if somebody has a very um, a molecule that has a very short half-life of maybe 5, 10, 20 minutes, uh, we're able to extend that uh, to, you know, multifold, uh, in many cases, several hours. Uh, we can also do uh, coordinated PK, PK, as you heard, uh, with the uh, uh, Celator compa compound, now the uh, Jazz compound. Uh, so what does that do? That allows us to modify the therapeutic index uh, to, uh, because we can uh, increase uh, half-life, uh, we don't just simply have to dump the uh, material. We can have sustained release. Uh, we can uh, change the biodistribution so that it's not a systemic distribution. Uh, in many cases, we can restrain it to the blood volume and the tumor volume. Uh, this allows us, as I said, to increase the uh, therapeutic index. Um, this, a couple of examples that you've already seen in this, um, in the clinical setting, uh, it's not just uh, theoretical, is one, uh, as you've seen and heard today, through Abraxane. Um, Abraxane decreased the hypersensitivity that we saw uh, with the legacy uh, compound. I also want to identify some of the very important uh, people that have contributed to this. 
Uh, so that's Neil Desai, who's, who's with us today. Uh, you've heard about the case of Doxel over and over again, um, and uh, let me acknowledge uh, uh, Hezzy. Uh, Hezzy uh, may seem grumpy, but he's actually a nice guy, so feel free to approach him. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the combination approach uh, through uh, Celator, um, uh, now uh, in, uh, by Jazz Pharmaceuticals, um, they were able to um, decrease the risk of death uh, for uh, their indication. Uh, recognize uh, Robert Prudhomme, who had played a, a very big role in uh, the scientific contributions to uh, Celator early on. And uh, Onavide, uh, you, you heard uh, Daryl Drummond's uh, talk uh, just uh, maybe an hour ago. Uh, so I use these as, um, as case studies to show that it's not hype. Uh, there's really things out there. Uh, one of my pet peeve is, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this, is uh, we often say, well, it's been 10 years. Uh, how come we're not seeing more clinical molecules? And as Peter just alluded to, oh, my goodness, you know, it takes 10 to 15 years to go from a concept into an NDA. Uh, so we're seeing some terrific things in, N in NCL, uh, but we need time. Uh, it takes time to get through those clinical trials. Um, okay, so let me do uh, some comparing and contrast between that proof of concept versus what we see at NCL and how we get into get you into clinical studies. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance if I if I use some sarcasm uh, because we see some uh, um, interesting concepts that are submitted to us, uh, but I want to say up front that our role is to help you, and it's an iterative process. And despite the fact that we'll see, I'll show you some uh, examples of what not to do uh, through an iterative process, we get you there. We still get you there. So I want to encourage you, um, as, you as you further develop your concepts. OK, one thing that we see is batch to batch inconsistencies, especially at that proof of concept level. level. Uh, so who really is doing the hands-on research in an academic lab? It's, it's, it's the graduate student and the postdoc. And so then the postdoc leaves, and uh, we have started a collaboration uh, with that entity. And we find out, well, that postdoc left, and he's the only one that knew how to use the microfluidizer, or you know, it only worked on alternate Tuesdays or something like that. Uh, so this, is, um, uh, th this really impacts what we're doing at NCL, because uh, our goal is to, is to show you what you have as an investigator. And to do that, we need to see that you're consistent over multiple batches. Uh, something that we run into often in the batches are contamination. Uh, just simply because a laboratory may not be familiar with aseptic technique, especially if they come from material sciences or a chemistry background. Uh, so we see contamination with endotoxin. In fact, 30% uh, of all submissions to NCL are contaminated, and we have to go back and ask the uh, investigator to clean it up because it is not compatible with a lot of the immunal uh, assays that we have uh, as we progress. Uh, we see... <coughs> um, in vitro testing that is, uh, is, is very difficult to translate into clinical trials. <clears throat> we see uh, publications that have uh, very terrific data, pristine data, uh, in aqueous solutions. But as soon as it hits a relevant physiological media, even PBS, uh, the, the concept falls apart. So please test your concepts in a, in a biologically re relevant media. Um, we often see... Um, at that proof of concept level, well, I injected in the six animals and none of them died, and so therefore it's non-toxic. Um, and uh, what we do at NCL is have uh, five to six animals per data point uh, and then multiple arms to do comparisons. Um, and in <coughs> uh, comparisons, uh, we also have to compare, as uh, Peter said, to the standard of care. Uh, we often see that it's there's a comparison against uh, untreated, and so yes, it uh, uh, shrinks the tumor, but how does that compare to what is currently a state of the art state of care uh, in the clinical trials? Uh, we also compare to the free API or the legacy API. Uh, we also have to look under in vitro characterization for uh, inhibition and enhancement controls because we'll often see false positives and false negatives. Uh, the EPR has been beat up to death today, so I'm not going to cover that too much, other than to say that that is not the be-all and end-all of um, nanomedicine evaluation. And, you know, let's be frank, uh, the, the end point for 
uh, academic um, uh, work is, is traditionally is, is the publication, it's the tenure, it's getting my next grant. Uh, and so, you know, we'll deal with endotoxin contamination once somebody funds me to do, deal with endotoxin contamination. And so we'll just pass it off and uh, hope, that, hope that somebody is uh, able to optimize uh, that type of scale up. Okay, so then let's transition to preclinical, what we do at NCL. Uh, the thing that we are faced with, and it's just a fact of life, is that 80% of all publications, all experiments uh, that we see are non-reproducible. Um, and we see that uh, within NCL. We've characterized some 360 uh, nanoparticles, and only 13 of those are in clinical trials because we were not able to reproduce some of that original efficacy data or it was uh, unstable as we uh, uh, subjected it to more rigorous uh, characterization. I mentioned the informative control arms uh, where uh, we have to make sure that uh, we, uh, we compare against the standard of care, we compare the precursors against the lead selection, uh, we compare uh, the free drug, uh, also, in, under in vitro conditions, we have to compare, as I mentioned, inhibition and enhancement controls. You've heard, that, you've heard me say that, say that now twice uh, because we'll often see uh, erroneous data in that. Uh, I mentioned the uh, uh, matrix that we characterize in. Uh, if you can, if you have access to it, uh, compare it against plasma, against blood, see what your particle does, see how it releases in those matrices. Um, and what we're headed towards, and we're making some success in this, is predictive in vitro models that predict in vivo responses. Uh, we're having success, especially in uh, the immunal uh, toxicity and uh, the immunal responses. Uh, so the endpoint here is a little bit different, um, and often it's unfunded by um, um, the, the community, in that endpoint is translation and regulatory application, getting into that IND filing. Uh, 12 years ago, now almost 13 years ago, NCI said, well, we have to address that gap in the valley of death, and that's why they stood up the NCL, is to be, just to be able to help you uh, with that transition. Uh, let me offer you some uh, more case studies on uh, the topics that I just presented. Um, in characterizing multiple batches, we also use orthogonal technologies. Uh, what I'm showing you here is size characterization by three different methods. Uh, first by TEM, uh, then by dynamic light scattering, and then finally by uh, field flow fractionation. And as you can see, you get different answers uh, between the, the, the uh, uh, three techniques, uh, where you may get something uh, by DLS that looks like it's fairly monodispersed. Uh, however, by AF4, uh, where we can go after individual particles, if you will, because there's, um, there, there's a separation involved, uh, we do see differences in size. Uh, so just make sure that uh, you've, you've cross-validated whatever technique you decide to use as you move forward. Uh, proper controls, I've, I've uh, labored the point, um, but um, we, we have to do this, especially in, as you heard from Frank today, uh, how does it compare to the uh, standard of care? How does your concept compare, especially for regulatory evaluation and approval? and acceptance into the, IA, well, sorry, approval finally by uh, the NDA. Um, and so uh, we make those comparisons. We help you uh, with those uh, at NCL. Uh, here's two examples. Uh, the example on the left is what I mentioned earlier, where um, the, uh, the, the concept was able to reduce um, uh, tumor size. We have a standing joke in NCL that uh, a sponsor will approach us and they'll say that um, in, a, in a Petri dish, uh, my concept uh, cures cancer. It kills the cells. Well, yes, so does a handgun. You know, it'll kill your cells or bleach. Um, uh, and so we need to see more than that, and that's what you see on the right. It's a proper evaluation with all the control arms. And if you're not capable of doing this or have the resources at your institute or at your uh, SME or even in pharma, uh, we can help you with, with uh, getting this data. Inhibition enhancement controls, uh, just very quickly, we've covered this in previous uh, conferences or <clears throat> previous clinums. Uh, what you're seeing there is a uh, sample that's been spiked with 0.4 endotoxin units, so you should be able to recover 0.4 endotoxin units in your assay. Uh, that's true in blue because that's water, uh, but in green you'll see something that inhibits that response. 
a, because it interacts with the nanoparticle and on the, in the, um, is that purple? Um, you see something that greatly enhanced that. <clears throat> in fact, we thought that we had uh, contamination with this particular uh, species, but it turns out that it, it cleaved the substrate, uh, the nanoparticle uh, did. And uh, the yellow one is, is how it's done right. So again, please keep this in mind as you characterize them, especially in vitro. Um, the appropriate buffer is exceptionally important. Uh, the example I'm giving you here is where uh, the sponsor had only characterized it in uh, PBS. Uh, however, when we characterized it in blood, what we saw is an aggregation of the particle um, and it um, then caused a hemolysis of it. Um, you can do this in your laboratory. The assays from NCL are available to you uh, free. They're on our website. Uh, please uh, take a look at them, uh, attempt to use them as a, as a starting point. Uh, so um, uh, I, the best way to do it is to think of it as, you know, the, the, was it the three bears? Uh, this porridge was too hot, this porridge was too cold. Uh, so what you see on the left there, if the, if the uh, concept is too stable, meaning the drug is not released, it's very, very safe, but it's, in, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, ineffective uh, because uh, the drug will never come off, it'll never hit the target. Uh, but on the right-hand side, if it's too unstable, uh, it'll dump as soon as uh, it hits the bloodstream, uh, and it can cause additional toxicity. And we've seen both of these, and hitting it just right, it takes quite a bit of optimization. Uh, we cannot do that for you. Uh, that's something that you as an investigator have to do. Um, using predictive in vitro and in vivo models, um, that first bullet there is, I say this tongue-in-cheek, but we've often seen um, uh, sponsors that will approach us and say, well, uh, we're targeting brain tumors, uh, but we used a, um, a, a brain tumor cell in a xenograph. Well, you know, the architecture and histology is completely different, uh, especially when you consider the BBB. Um, and so if you can, if you have the means, use an orthotopic model uh, if you're going after something like pancreatic or, or a, a brain tumor. Um, let me move on. Uh, okay, so uh, nanomedicine is not the be all and end all. It has limitations. Um, uh, we've, we've seen am amazing successes over the last 10 years, especially in the preclinical models. Uh, I'm a huge advocate. Um, I, I took the position 12 years ago and I have not looked back since just because of the amazing capabilities that I see uh, in preclinical. Regrettably, I cannot share a lot of those with you because. Uh, the submissions are done under non-disclosure. Uh, so, so what are some of the limitations? Um, well, um, you're, you're not going to uh, see a huge difference in uh, therapeutic, or not therapeutic index, but uh, efficacy if you're reformulating a off-patent drug. You're still going to rely on the same mechanism of action for that drug. You can change the drug delivery properties uh, but you're not going to see this huge uh, increase uh, in efficacy. Uh, that is changing, and I'll get to that in just a second, uh, with the promise of, of new drugs that are coming up in the pipeline. Um, you're going to hear the theme defining critical attributes, and what does that mean? Uh, that is the attributes that pertain to your specific concept, especially in the manufacturing and controls. I'll give you a few examples of those. Um, and uh, evaluating, now that we're 10 years into it, we're seeing that, that next generation of uh, particles come through that are able to do things like 505B2, 505J. Uh, so we're seeing those generics, those uh, what we refer to as uh, non-biologic non complex drugs, or NBCDs, uh, come through. Okay, and I, I mentioned this. Um, uh, just keep this in mind uh, as you're attempting to commercialize it. What is the added value of your concept over the uh, existing formulation and the existing state of the art in the clinic? Uh, if it is the same drug, what are you offering? Are you offering extended half-life? Are you offering targeting? If you're just offering another liposomal formulation of doxorubicin, it's been done. Uh, so, um, so, so try and uh, find that niche for your specific particle and your specific concept. I'll hit this again, but uh, at NCL now, in the last year and a half, we've had uh, pharma approach us 
uh, extensively and say, hey, we've got a terrific new molecule, NCL, can you do a proof of concept for us? So we're now doing that early stage. The idea is that we would help them with that proof of concept to hit a specific milestone and then turn it back over to the pharma and then they can approach maybe even some of you uh, with uh, further optimization. Uh, these critical attributes are unique to each nanoformulation. Uh, I've heard people ask the FDA, well, what are my critical attributes? Well, they're going to say, well, you need to tell us what those are. Uh, it's because it becomes a circular argument because you know your, your concept far better than anyone else. Uh, you, know, you know what density of PEG you have on the surface. You know what the stoichiometry of your ligand and receptor and, and, and drug are. Uh, so be sure that you capture that and begin to understand what those are as you scale up uh, because it's, uh, you know, I'll just state the obvious, there's a huge difference between a, a, a 50 mil conical flask or round bottom flask and you don't just, it's not linear to go into scale up. You have to know what, what parameters to look at uh, during that process. We can help you with it, uh, but uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, here's an example. This one uh, didn't go into clinical trials. Uh, but uh, uh, for this particular concept, they needed to know and, and hit uh, the specific number of amines that had to be passivated in order to uh, achieve their intended purpose. Okay, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, you'll hear this uh, throughout the, um, the conference, especially tomorrow morning at 8.20 uh, with the NBCD group and understanding how you do comparative studies between uh, follow-ons, and that is... TE equals PE plus BE. Keep that in mind. You'll hear it more and more and more. And I also want to just uh, pl put a plug in for FDA. We're a formal collaboration with the FDA. When I first took over NCL, I, I saw FDA as this black box of you just kind of throw stuff at them and they say, no, you didn't, didn't work. Well, it's not like that at all. These guys have friends and family and neighbors uh, that, are, that are suffering from, from cancer. Uh, so they're very interested in that scientific process. Uh, it's an iterative process with us where we generate data. Uh, it's uh, freely open to NCL. Uh, they can also approach us with, with questions and problems that they're addressing as they review concepts and we can generate data in support of them. Um, and as has been said many times, the key measure is therapeutic in index and uh, patient outcomes. Uh, that's really what we're about. And um, being able to do that is, is a very re rewarding job. Let me just encourage you that you're part of something that's very important. Uh, so in conclusion, some of the uh, key points that we're finding at NCL, um, and so do proper evaluation early in development because don't try to hide it. We're going to find it and the FDA is going to find it. Let us help you try and optimize that and engineer around it. Um, we are able to link PCC with biological outcomes. I mentioned critical attributes um, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, far more concepts into clinical trials as the years progress, uh, but it does take a, take a while. With that, that let me recognize uh, the very important people at NCL. Uh, Steve Stern is in charge of most of our in vitro, or sorry, in vivo work, as well as uh, farm talks. Uh, Marina Dabrowskaya is our immunologist and is in charge of a lot of our in vitro evaluation. And uh, uh, Jeff Clogston uh, handles the uh, physical chemical characterization. With that, thanks for your time, and I'm way out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you.